Again, if you take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 96, Psalm 96. I was going to preach on nine, Psalms 97. After I got it done, I realized that Psalm 96 goes along with Psalm 97. So Psalm 97 we'll bring to you next week. But for this morning, Psalm 96. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great, greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, and the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh. For he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. The title of the message this morning is God's greatness and glory. God's greatness and glory. This psalm is evidently taken from that sacred song which was composed by David when he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and placed it in the midst of the tent he had prepared for it. So you turn over to um, First Chronicles. We can see this actually transpiring. <clears throat> First Chronicles chapter 15. And starting at verse 25. First Chronicles chapter 15, starting at verse 25. So David and the elders of Israel and the captain over thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. And all the Levites that bear the Ark and the singers and Kenuniah, the master of the song, with the singers. David also had upon him an ephod of linen. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the cornet and with trumpets and with cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. And it came to pass, as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came 
to the city of David, that Michelle, the daughter of Saul, looking out at, out at a window, saw King David dancing and playing, and she despised him in her heart. The word dancing there also can mean twirling about. So David was dancing, and he was more than that. He was twirling. He was happy. He was joyous. He was ecstatic of what is transpiring. Chapter 16 of First Chronicles, the first four verses. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent, and David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And he dealt to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. And he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. So we can see that David enthusiastically um, showed his thankfulness openly to the Lord and to Israel, and to all those that were around. And he made a he made a direct implication of what was going on, that this was from God, and that God had brought this into play, and he was just ecstatic about it. So it kind of puts us in a place that, when we come into the house of God, that there should be enthusiasm. There should be an ecstaticness that we are able to be here and that, you know, that we should be more than uh, anything else joyous to be here. Amen. This song in First Chronicles, it is a grand missionary hymn. Us being missionaries in this particular town, uh, we need to, even though it's difficult at times, we need to be joyous, we need to be happy, we need to be enthusiastic about what we're doing. And uh, we need to be ready and prepared uh, to meet any challenges that may face us, especially if we, once we get into the new building. So the first point I'd like to make this morning is the new song. The new song. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. So three times we are told to sing unto the Lord. And many times, and I've been there, I know how it feels, but when we're singing congregationally, we have a tendency not to sing out because, well, maybe we can't sing well. I mean, that's my, my, my part. I can't sing well, so I kind of don't say it. You know, I don't sing it loud because of that purpose. And uh, so we have to get out of that because it's not singing to each other. It's singing unto the Lord. He doesn't care what we sound like. First of all, the Holy Spirit takes whatever we do and makes it pleasing unto him. So no matter how bad you sound, by the time it reaches his ears, it's going to be glorious. See? So let's not try to um, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So this, con this really conveys the, the three times sing unto the Lord. This conveys the Trinity. His name, his fame, his character... His revealed word and will are to be remembered and sung about. We may well sing of the one who has divinely blessed us. 
Secondly, we are to sing a new song. A song of new blessings and new favors. A new song about the new covenant and the precious privileges it affords us. We have a true blessing from God. I mean, when I started 11 years ago, and those of you that came to West Jefferson in, in, in the first part of it, uh, you know, it, it was just a far away dream, you know, to have a building and we could come and worship God in. We, you know, we become organized into a New Testament Baptist church and serve God in that building. Now it has come to pass. We're almost there. We're almost done. We're almost to that completion point that that's what we can do. So, you know, it's time that we sing a new song. A song of new blessings and favors. I mean, there's a lot of things that's going to transpire there. There's a lot of things that once we're in, we will have to do. I mean, there will still things that will need to be done over there. A new song about the new covenant and the precious privileges that it affords us. A new song that shall never wax old and stale, everlasting new. We're given a new opportunity. I mean, not everybody has the opportunity to have a, you know, a, a new building, to start afresh, to start anew, and, 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 and organized into a, a New Testament Baptist church. That's probably the, one of the greatest things. When I started this work, I was honest enough to run to people. I said, here's how much it's going to cost, you know, every place I went. When I, when I went out to other churches and preached and did the deputation work, you know, that's why I told them. I said, here's what it's going to cost. So this is the price that we're going to have to pay, whether we build or whether we buy. We will remain a mission until the Lord blesses us to organize into New Testament church. That's the goal. That's what we've been doing these past 11 years. So everyone knew, anyone, everyone that supports us, you know, I, I, I hope you pray for those folks, but those who that support the mission, they're the ones that helped us get to where we're at. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be at that point. It's not that they believed in me, but they believed in God. They believed in the work. They believed in a mission started here in West Jeff for the purpose of preaching and, and presenting the gospel to the lost. Thirdly, it is to be a joyful song. We should be singing with joy in our hearts. If we sing with joy in our hearts, then there shouldn't be a, a, a limited volume of our singing. That's why I said you may want to step it up a little bit, you know. <laughs> Put it out. Show God how joyous you are, filled with praise and thanksgiving. It is to be a song missionary in nature. That is, we are to sing of his salvation. The gospel is our uh, clearest revelation of God. Tells who he is, tells what he's done. Salvation outshines uh, creation and providence. One of the, probably the hardest things that we face as, as, as people come and maybe check us out to see what we're doing is they're going to say, never heard that stuff before. Never heard that kind of preaching. Never heard that from the Word of God. So they're in for a new experience as well. They're used to worldly religion. I remember when Brother Larry and I first went, we went down to uh, the, and out there where Brother Ray lives, I can't think of the name of the little town there, but uh, where he lives out there before you get on to uh, 70 or 270. And 
there's a print shop there. But Larry and I went into the print shop and that's where we got uh, the signs for the windows and the doors. And we told her what we wanted and she looked at it and she says, oh, are you new church? I said, yeah, we're a mission. We're starring West Jefferson. Oh, she said, the people are really nice there. They're real, real religious. So we know we're in an area that people are religious, but what they believe is religious isn't godly, see? Big difference. So let us proclaim the glad tiding constantly and worldwide by song, by sermon, by deed, by baptism, by the Lord's Supper, by books, and by public worship that lets us declare the rock of our salvation worldwide. That's what verse 3 gives us. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. Second point, verses 4 through 6, the Lord supreme. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. So supreme in his power and personality. There is none like him. He is supreme. His wonders are massive beyond comprehension his rule is sovereign and his glory is displayed in the person of his son turn over to hebrews chapter 1 hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 hebrews 1 1 God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Supreme in his power and personality, supreme in the worship he demands. Look at the latter part in our text there of verse 4. He is to be feared above all gods. Other so called gods have been worshiped at great cost and with much fervor by their followers, but Jehovah must be adored with far greater reverence. Holy fear is the beginning of all graces. Dread of other gods is mere superstition, but awe of the Lord is pure religion. Thirdly, supreme in the reality of his existence. Verse 5, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. John 1.1. 1, 1. Holy fear, again, is the beginning of graces. When we look at the supreme in the reality of his existence, the reality of his Godhead is proven by his works. 
what he does and how he does it. He is the master architect. And when I look at that, I say, you know, God is the master architect. How many times have we had gone back to our architect and got things changed in the prints? I worked in a print room at GM for uh, about eight years, and there was a constant, you know, the, the engineers were constantly coming in, let me see them prints, let me see them prints, and they'd have changing them, redesigning them, making, making adjustments, you know, oh, this was wrong, this isn't right, and, and oh, God never done that. See, he's the master architect. When he made the plans, they've never changed. They still exist today as they did when he made them. And they will continue to do so. So he doesn't go back, doesn't have to go back and make any changes or, or corrections because everything is perfect. Amen. Fourthly, supreme in his majesty and glory. Verse 6, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Honor well, man can but mimic his traits. Honor and majesty are with him alone. In him are combined all that is mighty, lovely, powerful, and magnificent. Therefore, men are to bring their glory and their strength and lay them at his feet. That's how we should come in to his sanctuary. That's how he should be served and worshiped. Brother Ray brought it out. When Moses was given what they were to do, when Korah was given what he's supposed to do, and, and many like Korah have done exactly what Korah did. They've done it their own way, and God is displeased. If you think God is pleased with all the religion out here and all the so-called churches, he's not. We may be small in number, but I know without a doubt that we have the truth. Amen. Yes. It's a big, huge difference in how God blesses. If we hadn't had the truth, then I know somebody's going to come along and say, well, other churches are building. That may be so. But I know that that's a direct result of the truth being preached here. Therefore, men are to bring their glory and their strength and lay them at his feet. Psalm 2, verse 10 through 12 says, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest... He be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. There's a need today for the truth. There's a need today to live the truth and preach the truth. And show forth the truth. Brings us to our next point. The required stewardship. See, as Brother, Brother Ray taught this morning, there was a required stewardship for Korah. For Aaron. For Moses. It was required. I always look at it this way. If... What would have happened, and we can answer that question, we know what would have happened. What would have happened when God came to Noah and says, I want you to build me an ark out of gopher wood, and this is how big he, I want it, and he says, no. And he said, no. What if Moses, when he was supposed to build the tabernacle, have you ever gone in and read it? Have you gone in and read it and, and went through the steps as God laid down to Moses all the, the fineries of it, how it was built, the kind of wood it was supposed to be used, the silver where silver was supposed to be used, the gold where gold was supposed to be used, the brass where brass was supposed to be used, this was supposed to be here, that was supposed to be there, and if Moses would have said, but I like this better, what do you think would have happened? That's what happened to Korah. 
we have to be careful that we pay attention to the required stewardship. Verse 7, Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name, bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him all the earth, say among the heathen, that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Required stewardship. We are here required to honor God. The term given to the Lord is mentioned three times. All men are required to give. All men are required to give God glory. All men are required to acknowledge his ownership and lordship. All men are required to worship him with their time, their talent, tithe, and tongue. We are required to honor God with gifts that benefit his name. Give unto the Lord, the, in verse 8 there, glory due unto his name. He is the God of first fruits, not the God of leftovers. Turn over to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, and look at verse 9. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheave of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheave, before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheave of the lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Then in Exodus 23 and the first part of 19 says, The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. God wants it done a certain way. We are to do it a certain way. We're not to look to him and say, but I'd rather do it this way because I like it better. Your way's too hard. Your way's too strict. Your way's doesn't make sense. You can't do that and expect God's blessing. Thirdly, we are required to honor God with sincere and reverent service. Verse 9, O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him all the earth. Not too many fearing them today, is there? First one that came to mind, of course, Brother Chuck mentioned it was Jerry Nadler. God doesn't have anything to do. Oh, he's got a lot to do. He's got a lot to do with Congress. He's got a lot to do with the United States. He's got a lot to do with the world. Because he's its creator. They'll know. They'll find out one day if he's not, if God is not pleased to save Jerry Nadler 
and he'll die in his sins, and he'll know that everything matters when it comes to God. Yes, Amen. This is <clears throat> the only beauty which God cares for in public service. He cares. We are required to honor God with sincere and reverent service. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It is the only one for which no other can compensate. You can't do it any other way. Worship must not be rendered to God in a sloppy manner, but in a sincere earnest and pure in heart, both in our prayers and our praises. Remember one time I have a lot of Catholic friends and one time they were questioned about what they were doing. They said, oh, that's okay, Monday. <laughs> that's okay when it comes to Sunday or the weekend when I go to Mass. He says, you know, I'll be forgiven all my sins and I can go back to whatever I was doing on Monday. And that's how it works for them. Worship isn't sloppy. We are required to preach the gospel to the nations. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. This is the gladsome news we are to share with other. The Lord reigns. That society is safe when God reigns. Society isn't safe right now, is he? Is it? Why? Because God isn't reigning. I mean, he is, but not in the sight of the people. People aren't giving him what's due him. The people are not putting him in that situation. They're doing it all on themselves. Do it my way. We'll do it the way I want to do it. We're to worship him. Present the gospel that the judgment of God is just. Sin has shaken the world, but the reign of Christ will set it straight and upon a sure foundation. And that's the problem with the world. Whether the world wants to admit it or not, the problem is sin. I remember my first pastor, he said, why do we die? Why do we die? Why do we get old? Why do we have all these aches and pains and all this and that and all these issues and all these problems? Sin. And lastly, the creation song. Verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful, and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. The author calls forth five pages out of the book of creation and writers upon them the happy notes of praise. The heavens, the earth, the sea, the field, the cultivated areas, and the forest. Let them all express their pleasure in seeing their true prince set upon his throne. People don't realize this. But non-living things praise the Lord. The mountains, the rocks, many things that we do not consider praise the Lord 
Why? Because he made them. And he made them so. Creation presents plight and future hope. Turn to Romans chapter 8 if you wouldn't hold your place there for at the end. But Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. Romans 8 and verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even, our, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Let all creation rejoice in the coming of Christ. Verse 13. Before the Lord, for he cometh. For he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. That will be a joyful day, won't it? That it is the duty of all to bid his kingdom welcome. That only when he comes with righteousness over the earth as the waters cover the sea and the character and extent of his kingdom. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11, if you would. Isaiah 11 and verse 1. Isaiah 11, 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play of the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the crocotrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, 
which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall be Gentiles seek, shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Of course, that's talking about the millennial kingdom and his millennial reign. These things will happen. These things will be like the Isaiah tells it. In conclusion, in closing, let us ourselves join in the song. Since the whole universe is to be clothed with smiles, shall not we be glad? The answer is yes. Yes, if we know Christ as our Savior, we have a hope of enjoying that coming kingdom with Christ. If you held your places there in chapter 8 of Romans, look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And I've told you before, that means that we can call him Papa. That's the relationship we have with God the Father through Christ Jesus. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, whatever Christ gets, we get. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We have amazing days ahead of us. I know the world is in chaos right now. I know America's in chaos right now. But we have a better world. One that's far greater than this world. And I put that, that uh, scripture in the bulletin that we, we have a building not made with hands. I mean, that's, that's going to be a great thing to be moved in that building. We're all going to be excited and joyous about it. But we're going to be in a building that's not made with hands. And live eternally with Jesus Christ and God the Father. We can go to him anytime, ask him anything. What a joy that will be. May God bless his word to your heart today.